Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about Kolmogorov Arnold networks. Kolmogorov Arnold networks are a new type of network that came came out in a paper around 10 days ago, and they are they want to compete with the multilayer perceptron. So in this video, I will be reviewing what are multilayer perceptrons because we want to um, compare the two models. Then I will introduce uh, data fitting because this um, um, topic is needed for us to understand the Bezier curves and the splines. Later on, we will uh, talk about the universal approximation theorem, at least for the multilayer perceptron, and the Kolmogorov Arnold representation theorem, which is the equivalent for the uh, Kans. Later, we will compare the two architectures and look at some properties that these uh, Kolmogorov Arnold networks have. What are the prerequisites for watching this video? Well, for sure that you have a background in calculus. For example, you know what is the derivative or what is the continuity of a function. And uh, you have a little bit of uh, knowledge of neural networks, even if I will review most of the concepts that we need to understand this new type of network. So let's start our journey. Uh, as you know, the multilayer perceptron is a neural network made up of layers of neurons, each one one after another, organized in a feed-forward way, which means that the output of one layer becomes the input of the next layer. And usually at each layer we also put some non-linear activation function, for example the ReLU. Uh, in this case we have a very simple network, as you can see we have uh, a input uh, vector of three features so you can think of this as the first feature this one as the second and this one as the third then we have a first layer made up of five neurons uh, you can think of it in pytorch it's a network that is from takes as input three features and produces output five output features this network here takes as input uh, five features and produces five output features and then we have a last one which is the which has the same structure Usually we put activation functions here at the layers. So let's view uh, how they work. In PyTorch, if you look at the documentation, you will see that the linear layer uh, that performs this very simple operation. It takes the uh, input, you can think of it as a vector made up of features, or you can think of it as a matrix made up of many items, each one having n input features. Um, then we multiply it by some weight matrix, so they call it A, I will call it a W, I think it's more easier to uh, understand this way. And plus we have a bias. Let's analyze the structure in detail. So, imagine we have a batch of input, the, we have like 10 inputs and each input uh, vector is made up of three features. Uh, I call here F1, F2 and F3, the three input feature. Our linear layer will perform the following operation, which is it will take the input, multiply it by some weight matrix that is made up of weights that are learnable by the network, plus a bias. The weight matrix, in this case, uh, we are talking about a linear layer that is taking as input three features and is producing five output features. So the weight matrix, the transpose of the weight matrix will be three by five where you can think of each neuron as being one column of weights. So each neuron will have n, um, n weights if n is the number of input features. One weight for each input feature. And uh, it will produce some output. So when we do the x multiplied by w transposed, it will perform this matrix multiplication, which will produce the following result. Let's analyze how these values are generated. The first output feature of this uh, matrix because you can think of this matrix as being a batch of 10 items because in the input we have 10 items as uh, a batch of 10 items each one having five features because the linear layer is from three features to five output features the first feature is generated by the dot product of the first item with the first neuron and it's this value here. The second output feature of the first item is the values of the, the features of the first item multiplied by the second neuron. So the weights of the second neuron, which means that each neuron is responsible for one output feature in this linear layer. Later, <coughs> after performing this multiplication, we also add a bias term, which in this case is a vector, one for each, uh, which has a, one value for each neuron, and we broadcast it to all of the um, this uh, uh, matrix here. 
which means that each output feature for each item will have an additional term which is the bias associated with this particular neuron so the first neuron will add uh, for the first feature will have um, the value plus b1 the second feature will have the, the value of the second feature plus b2 etc etc and this will produce the output of the linear layer so as you can see we started with a batch of 10 items with three features each and we end up with 10 items with 5 features each because the linear layer is from 3 to 5 and if you want the formula on how to calculate the, uh, the output of this matrix it's here so basically it's the the input features of each item multiplied by the weight of the corresponding neuron plus the bias term Now, <clears throat> we may be wondering, why do we need activation functions in linear layers? Well, let's analyze what happens when we don't have any activation function, because uh, imagine uh, here, let's go back here. Imagine you only apply linear layers one after another without introducing any non-linearities like the ReLU. What will happen? Well. Um, let's do this product uh, by hand. So uh, imagine we have an input, we perform uh, uh, the multiplication with the weights of the first layer, I call it W1, plus the bias of the first layer, and this will produce some output, just like before. Imagine we are going from three features to five features, it means that the input is, uh, okay, in this case it's a vector, but you can think of it also as a batch. Uh, it will be 10 by, or 1 by 3, and it will produce an output that is 1 by 5. Then we apply a second linear layer, which means that the output of the first linear layer becomes the input of the second linear layer, and because we are not applying any non-linearities for now. So it will become the input of the second linear layer will be, will be the output of the first one, so it's, this is the new input. If we expand the expression of this input, it becomes like this, we distribute this product, it will become this uh, expression here. And you can see that uh, this expression is nothing more than just a linear relationship between the input and the output. Uh, let me draw here. So this one is just a kind of, you can think of it as a weight matrix, and this one is just a bias term. So the input is related to the output by a linear relationship, which means that our multilayer perceptron, without any non linear activation functions, will only be able to map um, data that has linear relationship. Um, which means that, what is a linear relationship? Which means that in two dimensions, the, the, the data is on a line or can be separated by the line, a line in the case we are doing classification or uh, in the case of three dimensions the data is on the plane or it can be separated by a plane in case we are doing classification or in the multiple dimensions it can be separated by a hyperplane so if the data is not linearly separable we say then it cannot be modeled by the multilayer perceptron without activation functions let me show you uh, with a concrete example uh, from the boolean gates you know the end uh, uh, gate and the xor gate so the end function takes as input is a boolean function that takes as input two booleans and produces the end of them let's do it here so uh, let's call it input one input two and the output of this end for zero zero it is zero for 0, 1, it is 0, for 1, 0, it is 0, and for 1, 1, it is 1. So the end is 1 only when both are uh, both the input are 1. If we plot this uh, the input and the output relationship, so suppose this is the first input, so input 1, and this is uh, uh, input 2, suppose also that here we have the 0, and here we have 1, and here we have 0, and here we have 1, it's a 1 only here and all the other places it's 0. Now we can always draw a line, for example this one, that can separate the 0 and the 1 in case we want to create a, a neural network that uh, calculates the end. And we can do that because the data is linearly separable. Um, however, we cannot do this for the XOR. So let me show you here. So if we have a, uh, let's draw the truth table for the XOR, it is a, so 
so it's input 1, input 2 and the output. So we have 0, 0 and it's 0. 0, 1 it is 1, 1, 0 it is 1 and 1, 1 it is 0. If we draw this, let's say this is input 1 and this is input 2, 0, 1. So it is 1 when you have 0, 1 or 1, 0 and it's 0 in the other places. Now here, no matter where you put the line, you will never be able to separate all the zeros from all the ones because if we put the line here, you still get in this region 0, 1, 1 and this is region 0. If we put the line like this, we still get a 0, 1 and 0, 1. If we put the line like this, we still get 0, 1. So because the data is not linearly separable, it cannot be uh, learned by a um, neural network without uh, acti non-linear activation functions. This is why we need non-linearities. Later we will see the theorem that is backing this. Now let's talk about another topic, which is data fitting. Now, data fitting means that we have a series of points and we want to fit a line, usually a polynomial line, between that passes through them. Now I want you to imagine this scenario. So imagine we are creating a game, a 2D game, in which we have a character that we want to animate through a path of made up of points. Of course, one way uh, to animate this character would be to uh, take these points and make straight lines between them. So we can animate our character from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. But it doesn't look so good, right? It's not so smooth, this movement. You would see the very rigid movement of this character. So one better way is to make a, a polynomial curve that is more curvy that passes through these points and generates a more smooth path. And this looks better. It's more beautiful, let's say. And one way to do it is to create a polynomial line that passes through these points that is curvy. How to do that practically? Well, uh, if you remember from high school, when you have two points, you can only draw a line between them. And if you have three uh, non-collinear points, means that they are not on the same straight line, you can uh, make a um, uh, quadratic curve pass through them, like a parabola, for example. And if you have uh, uh, four points, you need an equation of degree three to make a polynomial line that passes through them. How to calculate the, the equation of this line that passes through the, all these points? Well, it's very easy. We, For example, imagine we have four points and uh, for example, this one, X and Y, you can see here we have four points. And what we do is we write the generic equ uh, equation of the polynomial curve of N minus one degree because we have four points, so N minus one is third degree. And then we create a, a system of equations in which we impose the fact that this curve has to pass from all these points. So we write the equation of the curve by substituting the coordinates of the first point through it, and then from the second point, then the third, and then the fourth. Now this is a, a system of equations that can be solved to retrieve the coefficients needed to get this line. You can do it with linear algebra, you can do it with Excel, whatever you like, or you just use the substitution method, which means that you get, the, for example, the A variable from here, from this uh, expression, you substituted the second uh, uh, equation, and you will get an equation that only depends on B, C, and D. Then you get another variable and you replace it in the third one, so you get one less variable to think about and then you do it again until you uh, arrive to the last equation in which you will only have one variable, you solve for it and then you replace it in the other to get the other the values of the other variables. Or you can use Excel, uh, you can draw the, um, the trend line, this is called the trend line and uh, Excel can also write you the equation of the curve that passes from these points. And this is a very uh, simple method for generating a polynomial curves. Now, what if we have hundreds of points and we want to generate a smooth line that passes through them? We can do that. So the procedure that we saw before, we can do that also with hundreds of points. But we have two problems. The first problem is the computational complexity, because you would need to solve a very big um, system of equations. And the second thing is that uh, as the number of points grows, uh, this polynomial line starts to behave more and more in a weird way at the extremes. For example, this is the plot of a polynomial degree 3 line that passes from 11 points. 
As you can see, in the middle we can still accept this kind of curvy lines, but in the extremes the, the curve starts behaving <laughs> in a crazy way. It means that if we animate our character using this polynomial line, it will move like this, it will move down and then go out of the screen <coughs> and then come back and then etc etc and then again will go out of the screen and then again will go out of the screen and then come back. So, as you can see, we want some way of also controlling how smooth this line is and to not make it um, go crazy like this in the extremes. That's why someone studied uh, this problem and solve it by introducing Bezier curves. So let's see how they work. Now, <clears throat> a Bezier curve is a parametric curve, and later we will see what it means to be parametric, that allow us to draw a smooth line given a series of points without the complexities that we saw before. Um, it is parametric in a sense that uh, um, it, allo um, it allows us to calculate, um, to calculate the equation of the interpolated curve, so the curve that passes from these points, but we will see that in the case of Bezier curve it does not pass from all the points, just get close, close to them. So it's parametric in the sense that the um, coordinates of the point on this interpolated curve depends on an independent variable called t, you can think of it as time, that goes from 0 to 1. In this case, for example, imagine we have only two points. As you know, with two points you can only draw a line, and the Bezier curve allows us to draw a line. So imagine you want to make a line between P0 and P1, what do we do? We start from P0, and we go towards P1, and this is our interpolated line. And as you can see, as time moves, the point gets closer to the second point and moves away from the first point. So you can think of the variable t as the variable time or the percentage of the animation that you are trying to make. Because uh, remember always the scenario that we are working in, which is we have a game and we want to animate our character between points. So at time step 0, the, the, I mean, the character is still at the point 0. As time moves on, it moves toward the second point. And this is the linear interpolation and it looks quite good, I mean, it's, it's a line. So how to get the equation of this point, as you can see, with respect to time? Well, this is the equation and it's very simple and it's very intuitive. So uh, the equation is basically, we start, it's a P0 plus something that is kind of a percentage and you can think of this term here as the vector that go from p0 to p1 which means that we start from p0 and as time moves on we add some percentage of this vector that move, takes us from p0 to p1 so when it will be 0.5 for example it means that it's p0 plus half the distance from p0 to p1 so it makes also intuitive sense on how we get the equation of this uh, point on this interpolated curve now this uh, curve is parametric so th and that's also the reason why you can see this b as bold and the t is not bold because it can be a vector it means that uh, this point can be uh, in x and y or z coordinates and all of these coordinates will depend on the t variable so at each time step it will tell us the position of our character in this 2d game that we are creating uh, with respect to, to time Okay, the, the example I show you is uh, very simple for uh, the linear curve between these two points. But of course we can extend it to three points. So if we have three points, we can draw a very smooth curve that, um, that interpolates them. However, unlike the previous case in which we have uh, the polynomial curve that passes through all the points in our path, in the case of Bezier curve, it only passes from the first point and the last point and interpolates between the intermediate ones. So it's, it's not touching the intermediate ones, it just goes closer to them. So how to calculate the, 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 the equation of this interpolated curve, which is the red one? Well, it's very simple also in this case. <coughs> what we do is we do a recursive calculation, which means that we first do a linear interpolation between P0 and P1, and we know how to do that. We have this equation here, so let me write here some stuff. So, we saw that to get the linear interpolation between two points, you can use this expression, which can also be written like this, so I just rearranged the terms, it's nothing uh, fancy here. Um, and to get for three points, we first do a linear interpolation between P0 and P1, which means that we apply this expression, so this, ex this expression here, 
to q0, uh, to p0 and p1, and it's this one, and we get a point that is q0 that in time will move from p0 to p1, just like this case here. Then we do another linear interpolation between p1, so this point here, and this point here. And it will result in a new point, q1, that in time will move from p1 to p2. These two points, q0 and q1, we create another linear interpolation between them. So we do another linear interpolation between q0 and q1, and this will give us the coordinate of the interpolated point, of the, uh, the curve that interpolates three points. So first we do the linear interpolation between the first two points, another linear interpolation between the other two points, and then we interpolate the interpolated curves between these two points, between these three points, and this will give us the, uh, the equation of the last, the final curve that interpolates the three of them. So if we replace the expression of Q0 and Q1, we get this one here. <clears throat> and then we can rearrange the terms to get this last uh, expression. And this is the um, this expression tells us the coordinates of the point of our character in this red curve you can see here as time moves on. So at the time step zero, it will be exactly here at point P zero. At time step one, it will be exactly in the point P two. And at time step, let's say 0 0.5, it will be more or less here, halfway. So this is how you read this expression. And, um, and as we can see, uh, the, the, in the Bezier curve, uh, we only touch the first point and the last point in the path, but not the intermediate points. We can extend this also to four points and also by using this recursive uh, calculation, which is we do the linear interpolation between P0 and P1, the linear interpolation between P1 and P2, the linear interpolation between P2 and P3. We will get three points in this case, uh, in this interpolated uh, curves. Then we do the linear interpolation between the first and the second, the second and the third. This will give us two points. And then we do another linear interpolation between the first and the second in this uh, third level interpolation. So as you can see, we do a kind of a recursive um, reasoning to arrive to the um, equation of the interpolated curve that interpolates all of these points. And also when we have four points, as you can see, we touch the first point and the last one, uh, but not the intermediate ones. Uh, one thing, nice thing about the Bezier curve is that we have a, an expression to calculate the equation of the uh, Bezier curve without doing all this recursive calculation. So if we have a series of points, let's um, n plus 1 points, so uh, these points here, so p0, p1, p2, p3, pn, we can calculate the expression of the interpolated curve between these points doing, using this expression here, in which you see one term that is called the Bernstein basis polynomials, uh, which depends only on t, each one multiplied by a point. Uh, a point. Now, a little bit of terminology. The points in a Bezier curve, but later we will see also in these lines, are called the control points, because they are the points in which we want to interpolate we want our curve to interpolate. And um, the Bernstein basis polynomials uh, is uh, one, one for each control point. It tells, um, and later we will see what they mean, but it's uh, this expression here. So it's a polynomial in T that depends on the point, because as you can see, there is an I here, and it's, there is I also here, and on the number of points that we have. Uh, this term here, so ni, you can see it's called the binomial coefficient and it has a very simple formula. So it is the, um, uh, the factorial of n divided by i n div uh, multiplied by n, mi uh, n minus i factorial. What does it mean in practice? If you remember from high school, the binomial coefficients tell us the coefficients of the binomial when it's raised to the nth power. So when you do a plus b to the power of 2, you get some coefficients, and I can write them here. So here you have 1a to the power of 2, here you have 2ab plus 1b2. And they are the same coefficients that we get in the previous e uh, equation Then when we calculated the um, the Bezier curve between three points. So here we get one, because as you can see here, we don't have any coefficient. Then we have a two, and then we have another one here, because this is the uh, second uh, order um, uh, Bezier curve, because it's a quadratic equation. 
and um, and uh, so basically you if you do it for two points you will get the same equation that we uh, arrived to in the previous slide now these Bernstein polynomials uh, as you can see we have uh, the equation of the final curve so this uh, b of t you can see here is obtained by a summation of each point multiplied by this function called Bernstein basis polynomials so how to interpret them well if I plot the Bernstein polynomials, for example, having, um, in this case, I think we have one, two, three, four, four, uh, four points. So this is a Bezier curve of degree three, in which we have uh, four points. Uh, how to, and th this will result in the following polynomials uh, uh, being generated. So how to interpret these uh, factors here, so these uh, polynomials here? Well, since we are multiplying each polynomial by the point, this polynomial tells us what is the contribution of each point to the uh, equation of the curve, of the interpolated curve. Let's see, for example, this example here. So at the time step zero, because you can think of the x-axis as the t time step, at time step zero, only one curve is contributing to the equation of the, la the final curve, you can see here, in this summation, and it's this blue line here. And it's the polynomial associated with the first point. Um, and it means that at the time step zero, there is uh, the, we, our character, which we are animating to this point, uh, will be exactly at the, point, the first point in our... Um, uh, Bezier curve because it's the only one contributing to the coordinates of the interpolated curve but as time moves on we start moving away from the first point and we start getting closer to the second point which is this green line here and uh, more or less at 0 0.33 we will be getting mm, the closest to the second point then we start moving away from the second point and we start getting closer to the third point, which is this red line here. And we will get the closest to the third point when we reach 0.66, so 66% of the animation percentage. And we then we start moving away for the third point and we start getting closer to the fourth point as time moves on. And when we reach time step 100%, we will be exactly at the last point in our Bezier curve. So that's why we will touch only the first point and the second point, but not all the intermediate points, because when we are in the intermediate phases of the time step, there are multiple points contributing to the final coordinate on the interpolated point so they will kind of it's like one point is pulling the curve in this direction but there is another point that is also pulling the the the, the curve towards itself so there is no one single point that wins in the intermediate step but at the beginning at the end there is only one point that is kind of winning in this pulling game okay now uh, we have seen uh, Bezier curves. Uh, now imagine that we have 100 points. <laughs> so with Bezier curve, when you have 100 points to interpolate, you need a Bezier curve of degree 99, which can be quite uh, computationally expensive to calculate. And um, so someone thought, well, why don't, instead of extending this Bezier curve uh, to very big polynomials, uh, why don't we stitch them, multiple of them together? So we take, uh, if we have 100 points, I can draw many Bezier curve and then find a way to stitch them together such that they also have some nice properties. And this is how B splines work. So let's see them in detail. Now imagine we have six points <clears throat> and uh, we want to uh, generate a line that interpolates between them. Uh, one way of course is to generate a Bezier curve of degree 5 that interpolates between these uh, six points. Another way is to do a B-spline in which we choose the degree of the Bezier curve that we want, we generate multiple of them and then we stitch them together and this is what is happening here. So let me show you with a concrete example. I took this from Wolfram Alpha. Uh, imagine we have these six points and uh, we want each uh, Bezier curve to be of degree two, which means that it's a quadratic uh, equation. Bezier curve of degree two needs three points. So what we can see is that uh, the first three points, so one, two, and three, will be one Bezier curve. 
The another Bezier curve will be the point 2, 3 and 4. This will be another Bezier curve. <coughs> the point 3, 4, 5 will generate another Bezier curve and the point 4, 5, 6 will generate another Bezier curve. So in total we have four Bezier curves and the points where they meet are called knots and you can see them here, these red, um, red dots here. Now, the Bezier curve, the B splines, uh, allow us to basically uh, have this Bezier curve meet in these knots and also define some nice properties that we will see later. But the, the, the thing that you need to understand now is that we have six points and we have four Bezier curve. So when you have n points and each Bezier curve that you want is of degree k, then you get n minus k Bezier curves. So if you want to visualize them here in this uh, graph, I can draw them. So between the first three points, we get one Bezier curve, which is this one. Between the second three points, you get another one, which is this one. Uh, between the third three points, you get another one, which is this one. Oops. And then between the last three points, you get another one. And then we stitch them together. So this one and this one will be stitched here, here at this point. And this one and this one will be stitched here at this point. And this one and this one will be stitched here at this point. If I increase the degree of the B spline, I will get less Bezier curve. So I will get less knots. Let's see. So now I increase the degree of the Bezier curve to 3. I get less Bezier curve because now each Bezier curve needs four points, so they have less stitching points, and so now we have only three Bezier curve. One is between one, two, three, and four. The second one is between um, uh, two, uh, three, four, five, and the third one is between three, four, five, and six. So we have three Bezier curve. When you stitch them together, you get two knots. Um, Let's see some more uh, properties. So, the first property that this B splines gives us is the continuity. So, based on the degree of the Bezier curve that makes up this B spline, we get a different uh, level of continuity. If you remember from high school, what is continuity? Continuity means that the function evaluation, when you... Uh, okay, first of all, simplified version of continuity. <laughs> If you remember from high school, a function is continuous when you can draw the graph of the function with ever, without ever leaving the pen from the paper. So this function is continuous, while this function here, for example, is not continuous because I, uh, there is a discontinuity point here, you can see here. Um, in mathematical terms, the continuity means that the limit from left and from right is equal to the evaluation of the function at that point. So it means that uh, if I go, if I go, I navigate this function from right and from left in the plot, I will reach the same height, which is uh, the case here. Here is continuity because if I go like this uh, or go like this, I will reach the same point. But it's not the uh, same here because if I go from right, I arrive here at this point. But if I go from left, I arrive here at this point. And these two points do not match, so it's not continuous. With the B splines, we get some different, de depending on the degree of the underlying Bezier curve, we get different levels of continuity. When we have a, a B-spline of uh, degree 2, we get C1 continuity, uh, C0 continuity, which means that the function here, basically it means that the two Bezier curve will touch, because it means that the function evaluation from left, uh, from left and from right will be the same, so the two functions will touch. Uh, when we increase the degree of the Bezier curve, so we use the cubic, for example, it will give us a C1 continuity. What does it mean to be C1 continuous? It means that the function is continuous in the point, in the knots, uh, but also that its derivative, its first derivative will be continuous, which means that the first derivative from right and from left will be the same. Uh, and you can see that here. So if you remember, what is the first derivative, the value of the first derivative? It indicates the inclination of the tangent line. So the, as you can see here, the inclination of the tangent line, if I move in this function from right, 
it's the same as the one on the left. And if we increase further the degree of the Bezier curve that makes up these B splines, we get C2 continuity, which means that not only the function is continuous at the nodes, not only the first derivative is continuous, but also the second derivative is continuous and equal. What does it mean practically? If you remember also, the second derivative indicates the concavity of the function in the point. The concavity can be ascending or it can be descending. In this case, for example, we do not have C2 continuity. So as you can see, if I move the function from right here at this node, I get upward concavity because the function is moving upward. But if I move from left, I get downward concavity which is not the case here because now we have um, C2 continuity. So if I move from right, it's upward. And if I move from left, I still get upward. So as you can see, the B splines also let us control the level of continuity that we want in the underlying curves by increasing the degree of the B spline. Uh, there is a nice formula also for calculating B splines, which is very similar to the formula that we got for the Bezier function. So given a series of points, that are, they are called the PI, and PI goes from 0 to n, so we have n plus 1 points. We can calculate the equation of the final interpolated curve using each point multiplied by a basis function, which just like in the case of the Bezier curve indicates the contribution to E of each point to the final interpolated curve. Let's visualize it with example. Uh, but okay, first, uh, this, this, um, this basis functions are generated using a recursive formula you can see here. So to calculate the because the basis functions, uh, the basis lines depends on the degree that you want to choose. You can choose the underlying Bezier curve to be quadratic, to be cubic, to be uh, degree four, etc. So you uh, you can um, for the same number of points, you will have uh, different uh, basis functions. And uh, the the basis functions uh, to calculate the basis function of the kth uh, level uh, basis line, you need the k minus one uh, levels uh, expression. And it's this uh, uh, recursive formula you can see here. I mean, there is, a, there is no strange term here. It's just a, a polynomial function that uses the previous expression, so k minus 1, to calculate the next one. So you, just re you start from this one, for example. This is the first degree, which is just a number 1 in the case um, the, the point falls between these two nodes or not. And then you increase it and you use the, the previous one to calculate the next one. Anyway, let's look at the basis functions uh, uh, like we did for the Bezier curves. So the basis functions, basically, once you fix the number of points that you have and the degree of the Bezier curve that makes up these B splines, you get some fixed basis functions that tell how much each point will contribute to the expression of the interpolated line. Let me show you here with the, the interactive example. Um, here in this case, I have a um, Bezier curve of degree 3 and I have six points. And you can see the, bis, uh, the basis functions are this one, which means that the first point will contribute the most to the, um, to the position of the, our character on the animated line when time step is zero. So it means that our character will be exactly on the first point because all the other basis functions are zero here. Well, as time moves on, we start going away from the first point and start getting closer to the second point, which happens at time step, uh, let's say here, 0 0.15, I think. So at 15%, more or less, we are the closest to the second point. And you can see here, right? When, as time moves further, we start going away from the second point and start getting closer to the third point. And you can see here, so we start going away from the first point and start getting closer to the second, uh, to the third point. And etc, etc for all the other points until we reach the last point in which all the basis functions go to zero and we start getting very, very, very close to the last point until we touch it because it's at the time step equal one it will be the only one contributing to the position of our character in the 
uh, interpolated curve. So uh, because it's the only one contributing, it means that it will exactly pass from that point. And it, this is the case, as you can see. So we pass from the first point and the last point, but not the intermediate ones. And now you also have a demonstration of how it works. There is another very interesting property that we will use in the Kolmogorov Arnold networks, which is local control. Local control means that if I move, let me repeat this animation again. So if I move a point in a B spline, it will change the shape of the interpolated line only in the locality, in the proximity of the point that I'm moving. It will not move all the rest of the curve. This depends on the degree of the uh, Bezier function that you are using. Uh, in this case, as you can see, when I move the fifth control point, it's only affecting the line that passes close to the fourth point and the sixth point, but not here, for example. Here you see some little changes, mostly because of the redrawing. It's not like the, 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 the curve has changed. It's mostly for the rendering, as you can see here. So this is a very interesting property that we will exploit later. Thank you for bearing me with me so far. I know that uh, it has been a long journey, uh, but I promise we will go to the <laughs> Kolmogorov Arnold networks uh, in very briefly. But first we need to talk about uh, the universal approximation theorem. So as you know, you can think of neural networks as uh, universal func function approximators. Um, why? Usually we have some training data. Uh, suppose that we have a classification task, like we have some pictures of uh, cats and dogs, and we have the corresponding label that tells us if this picture is a cat or it's a, a dog. Uh, we train a network to uh, classify these uh, cats and dogs. But uh, uh, why? Because we, we think that this, this training data comes from a function that is an ideal function that we do not have access to, that can match perfectly the picture of the cat with the label cat and the picture of a dog with the, fun uh, with the label dog. And we try to approximate this ideal function that we do not have with an approximate function that is our neural network. But how do we know that if our neural network can even approximate this ideal function, how do we know that, if, 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 that our neural network is powerful enough to learn this mapping between input and output? Well, we have some theoretical results that give us some guarantees. And uh, the ther universal approximation theorem, it's about this. It tells us what are the limits of what neural networks can learn. And it has been proven that neural network with a certain uh, depth, which means a certain number of layers, and a certain width, which means the certain number of neurons, when using non-continuous, uh, non-linear activation functions, for example, the ReLU function, they can approximate any function. And I also want to emphasize on what it means to approximate a function. It means that if we have an ideal function that we, that we want to approximate, we can get a, an approximation that is as good as we want. It means that we can choose an error rate between the, um, between the ideal function and the approximated function, and we can make our approximation as good as we want below this error rate. However, this is a theoretical result. So this is why, first of all, that we can use neural networks. So when we use neural networks, we have some guarantees that tell us, okay, our neural network is able to learn this data. Then how to learn it or which weights to use or how many depth uh, layers to use or how many neurons to use or which activation functions to use or how to structure it, that's of course an undefined problem. These are practical problems, but we have some theory, theoretical result that says that at least we can do it. The, our neural network has the expressive power to, uh, to map this data, to, this, uh, to, to learn this relationship between input and output. Of course, we have some practical problems when actually training a neural network to learn some uh, the training data. First of all, to get good approximation, it may take some computational power that we do not have. Maybe it will take, uh, you know, thousands of GPUs that probably we do not have. Uh, it may need a larger quantity of data than training data that we do not have. Or maybe our hardware uh, may not support the representation needed for the weights to carry on this training. For example, imagine that an ideal approximation within that particular error rate that we have chosen needs the weights to be 0.000000000 something. 
But of course, with the 32 bit, we cannot represent such big, small numbers with high precision. So, of course, we also have some hardware limitations on what we can actually do to train our network to be good approximators. And also, of course, there is the point of the optimizer, right? It also depends on if our optimizer can get stuck in the local minima, so it will never be able to go to the actual good uh, approximation that we are trying to achieve. So, just because a neural lear a network can learn anything doesn't mean that we are actually able to do it in practice. But at least we have some, uh, we, we know that our limits are practical. Now, this is valid for neural networks, so the multilayer perceptron that we have seen before. We start our tractation of the kolmogorov uh, arnold networks by introducing the kolmogorov arnold representation theorem, which is the theoretical backing for the kolmogorov arnold networks, just like the universal approximation theorem is the theoretical backing for the multilayer perceptron. It tells us that uh, if we have a function that is a multivariate function, it means that as input you have a vector of features on a bounded domain, and this is the domain, then it can be written as a finite composition, it means that this summation is finite and not infinite, of functions of single variable, which are this phi here, and the binary addition of operation. So basically it says that any function that we want can be approximated like this, more or less, within the uh, constraint written here. And this is the basis foundation of the kolmogorov arnold uh, networks. So they exploit this theoretical backing to say we can approximate any function if we structure our network like this. So now let's explore how this works in practice. So let's rewrite our um, the function of the kolmogorov arnold uh, representation theorem, which is this one. And suppose that we have an input, an input that is made up of two features. So the, in the, the formula here, n indicates the number of uh, features of the incoming vector x. In this case, suppose that we have two features, so x1 and x2. This is our, the, the input of our network. Then we, as you can see from the formula, this um, each feature is run through a function called phi, uh, which depends on two indices. One is q and one is p. Q goes from one to two n plus one. N is equal to two, so two n plus one is equal to five. So q will go from one to five, and p is goes from one to n. So n is the number of features. So p will go from one to two. So we have a q that goes from 1 to 5 and p that goes from 1 to 2. So in total, we will have 10 functions. Uh, phi 1, 1, phi 2, 1, phi 3, 1, phi 4, 1, 5, 1, etc., etc., until we reach 5, 2. Then what happens? Well, we um, run, for example, the first, uh, suppose q is equal to 1. We run x1 and x2 through phi 1, 1, and phi, 1, 2, as follows. They will produce some results, and these results are summed up through this summation you can see here. Then the result of this summation is run to another function called phi, 1, and it's this function here. We do it for all the values of q, so we do it for q is equal to 2, q is equal to 3, 4, and 5. This will produce phi, um, the output of a phi1, phi2, phi3, phi4, phi5, and then we run this summation here, you can see here. Now, I know that all this looks abstract, so I want to give you some analogy with the multilayer perceptron to understand what is happening. So, in the multilayer perceptron, if you remember, we have a two input feature, or we have three input feature, whatever, and then what we do? We have some neurons. The neurons multiply each input feature with one weight. In this case, we are not multiplying the input feature with any weight, we are running it through a function, as you can see here. And then we are summing up the results of these functions, which is also something that happened in the neural networks, uh, multilayer perceptrons. So, let me write here, so in the neural network, in the multilayer perceptron, here you had like W1 for the first neuron, and here you had W2 for the second neuron. You take the X2 multiplied by W2, X1 multiplied by W1, and then you sum them up here. And this would be the output of the first neuron in case there is no bias. In this case, we are not 
multiplying them with a weight but we are running them through functions and these functions are learnable so the kolmogorov arnold networks instead of having weights have functions and instead of having weights that are learnable they have functions that are learnable then we take this uh, output here we run it through another uh, function this one here um, and then we sum the results of all these uh, functions now um, you can think of this neural uh, this network uh, not as uh, as two layers um, so the, because this we, we want to introduce the multi-layer kolmogorov arnold network so we need to understand what I, what it means to have a m multiple layers by analogy with the multi-layer perceptron you, we can think of this uh, network as being a multi-layer network in which the first layer is going from two features to five features where each feature is produced by not two weights but by two functions so you can think of this as the output of a neuron in the kolmogorov arnold networks that takes as input the first feature runs it through a, a function takes as input to the second feature, runs it through another function, and then sums up the result and produce one feature. We do it for the second feature, we do it for the third feature, we do it for the fourth feature and the fifth features. Then what do we do? We have another network uh, layer that is going from five features to one feature. So we have, um, we run each of these features through a function, it's like we are multiplying by a weight in the multilayer perceptron and then we sum up all these um, uh, the, the results of these functions in the case of the multilayer perceptron we would sum what each feature multiplied by its weight in this case we are summing up each feature running through its own function so as you can see we have now the concept of multilayer kolmogorov arnold networks because this network can be thought of as a first layer that is going from two features to five and the second layer that is going from five features to one instead of having each feature multiplied by its weight we have each feature running through its own function instead of having learnable weights we have learnable functions and later we will see what do we learn of these functions because i didn't tell you what are we learning from this function? How do we learn this function? What are the parameters that we are learning in these functions? And in the paper, they also make a very nice comparison between the multilayer perceptron and the kolmogorov arnold networks. Um, so, as I said before, we have, uh, first of all, in the multilayer perceptron, the theorem that is backing the, the, their expressive power is called the universal approximation theorem. In the case of the kolmogorov arnold network, it's the kolmogorov arnold representation theorem. And uh, in the case of the um, multilayer perceptron, we have some input features. So in this case, we have two features. So let's call this one x1 and x2. They say that we have learnable weights on edges because actually, if you remember, each x1 is multiplied by w1 for the first neuron and uh, x2 is multiplied by w2. So you can think of here having a, a weight that is learnable. Then we sum up, so x1 multiplied by w1, x2 multiplied by w2, then we sum up, we run it through some activation function, in this case it is the ReLU function, looks like the ReLU function. Then the output is, uh, and it will produce some output. And then we have another layer that is going from, these are, this will produce five features, so this is five features. Uh, and then we have another layer that is going from five features to one output feature. Uh, so it's also a multi-layer uh, perceptron here because we have two layers one is from 2 to 5 and the second one is from 5 to 1 here in the case of the can we also have a 2 to 5 and 5 to 1 because we have here two features and here we have five features and here we have one feature but instead of having weights we have functions like we saw before so each input feature is not multiplied by a weight but it's run through a function that is learnable and then we sum up um, and this will produce one feature, the second feature, the third feature, the fourth feature, and the fifth feature. And then we have another layer that will take each feature and will run, run it through a network instead of multiplying by the weight. And then we sum the, all of them to produce one output feature. Um, here uh, you can see uh, they write that we have the sum operation no nodes, and this is what we did. So each feature run through its own function, and uh, then we sum um, uh, each um, for each output feature that we want to produce at each layer and this is uh, the comparison of how they work so now let's look at their properties 
Now, the multilayer accounts, okay, actually, I have already described it, how it works, but they also make a representation in the paper. So you can think of this as a multilayer uh, CAN, in which the first layer is going from two features. So here you have two features to five, and then from five to one. And instead of having weights, we have these functions that are learnable. So now let's concentrate on what, does, what do we learn from these functions. Um, here in the paper, they also write the implementation details. So, the formula for the uh, multilayer, uh, not for the for the Kolmogorov RNO network, is this one, and we have this phi function here that are uh, learnable. Uh, here, even if the expression is different, actually you have to think that this phi q and phi q p are both functions that are learnable. So there is no big difference between them. they are both bis clients and they are learnable. But um, they, they model this phi of uh, uh, x, which are the functions that we want to learn, not as only a bispline, but as a bispline plus something. Something that is fixed, and it's another function that is the silu function here. Um, so the only thing that we are actually learning is this part of the function. So they not only... Uh, they don't... Um, treat this phi of x as a learnable function in its entirety, but only it's one part, because it's a, it's a sum of two functions, and only one of them is actually learnable, and it's the bispline part. Now, if you remember the formula for the bispline, I, as we saw before, it is each control point multiplied by its basis function. Uh, the basis functions, as I told you before, once you have chosen how many control points you have and the degree of the underlying basis, um, the Bezier curve, you have a fixed uh, basis functions. Because the basis functions just tells you what is the contribution of each control point to the final interpolated curve. So the only thing that we need to learn in a bispline is actually how to put the control points to interpolate any function that we want. For example, imagine, let's do a concrete example. Imagine that our network needs for its purposes to reduce the loss to learn a sinusoidal function. So it, our network will learn to put the control points like this using the same basis functions. Another part of the network, uh, using the same basis function, so because the degree didn't change, it's fixed for all the uh, basis functions that we want to learn, uh, for all the bisplines that we want to learn. Another part of the network uh, probably maybe needs to learn, uh, let's say, uh, an exponential function. So it will learn, using the same basis functions, to put the control points like this. So it will create something that is growing, oops, very ugly. So we go up, then we go up, then we go up, up and up like this maybe another part and as you can see the basis functions didn't change the only thing that is changing is the position of how we put our control points and we can get different shapes so this is the power of the bisplines so we have these uh, parameters that we can learn which are the positions of our control points that can make our bispline have any shape that we want if the number of control points is enough, of course. We, we cannot create a sinusoidal function, only have two points, right? Because we can only draw a line. Uh, so, but we will see later uh, how can we increase the number of control points. Uh, let's compare the parameters count between the multilayer perceptron and the um, Kolmogorov Arnold networks. Well, imagine that you have a multilayer, multi uh, MLP, so multilayer perceptron, and it's made up of, let's say, L layers. So you have one layer after another, like this. And each layer, each layer is taking as input N features, and it's producing N features as output. As we saw before, the layer of a linear layer has a weight matrix that is input feature by output feature. So in this case, the input feature and the output feature are the same and they are equal to n. So we will have a weight matrix that is n to the power of 2 for each of the layer. Here we will also have n to the power of 2 weight matrix here also, etc. Suppose that we don't have any bias and we have L layers. So the total parameter count of this neural network is n to the power of 2 multiplied by L in the case of the multilayer perceptron. 
In the case of the Kolmogorov Arnold network, we do not have weights, but we have learnable functions. We have the same number of learnable functions because once you have an input layer in the CANS that is taking, for example, we saw before, we have two features input and we have five features output. So in total, we have 10 functions to learn. So it, is, uh, it means that when we have n input features and n output features, we will have n to the power of two functions to learn. For L layers means that we have n to the power of two multiplied by L functions to learn. But each function also has some parameters that we need to learn, which are the position of these control points. So we need to learn this P of I term here in the expression of these BIS lines. And um, it depends on the degree of the function, uh, because it uh, depends on uh, what is the degree of the underlying Bezier curve that we are using and how many knots we have. This They call it a grid here, uh, but they are the knots, so the meeting point of these um, Bezier uh, curves. So. In the case of the CANS, we have more parameters to learn because we have n to the power of 2L functions to learn and each function has to learn 5G plus K parameters where G is the number of nodes and K is the degree of the Bezier function, underlying Bezier function uh, curve. Another interesting feature of kolmogorov arnold networks is that we can increase the number of control points in each of these learnable functions to give the learnable function more expressive power to map any kind of uh, function that it needs for its purpose. So imagine we are training a network and our network uh, to reduce its loss it needs to uh, learn a, si a sinusoidal function, but we defined only two control points so it's not possible to learn a sinusoidal function having only two control points. What we can do is that instead of without changing the structure of the network we can increase the number of control points at each of these functions so they can learn more complex mappings. Um, this is called the grid extension in the paper and it's something that we cannot do in the multilayer perceptron because imagine in the multilayer perceptron you have a linear layer. Uh, a sequence of linear layers, one that takes as input, let's say, three features, and one that uh, produces five features, and another one that takes as input five features and produces uh, ten features. If you want to increase the expressive power of this linear layer, you need to either increase the number of output features, which means basically you increase the number of neurons, uh, but this will affect also the next layer, because if you increase it to 6, then the next layer will also be affected. Uh, this, however, does not happen with the kolmogorov arnold networks, because... Uh, let me give you an example. Actually, we can also go before, here. We can increase um, the power, expressive power of this function here, or this function here, or this function here, or all of them, without changing the structure of the network. So they will still produce five features as output, but this single function can learn more complex uh, mappings. Because maybe we chose uh, initially only three points, and the three points are not enough to learn a complex function like the cosine. So we can increase it to 10 points and the structure of the network will be the same. And they also provide um, a way to, in, because of course we increase the parameters and we need to find a way to transfer the parameters of the old network into the new extended network without changing the behavior of the overall functioning of the uh, uh, kolmogorov arnold network. And they basically they say that we can initialize the new uh, parameters, so the additional parameters, using the old ones by making sure that the output of the network at these functions is behave the same for the same input. So basically they reduce the, um, you can see here, the loss function here, the minimizing the distance between the old output of this function and the new output for the same input. So you can initialize these additional parameters in this way. And it's something that we can do because we have learnable functions now. Uh, another interest, interesting property is interpretability of these networks. Now, what is interpretability? Interpretability means that we want to be able to understand how our network things, even if it's very wrong to say things, but um, how our network makes its prediction, something that we as humans can interpret. Imagine we have a language model with billions of parameters, we will never be able to understand uh, by analyzing each single parameter how it made its prediction, because there are too many of these parameters, and to give an interpretation to each of them it's humanly impossible. 
However, for simpler networks, it is possible. But the problem with uh, neural networks is that because they do not learn any functions, they are just a sum of weights with non-linearities, they still make it very difficult to give an interpretation even for small networks. In this toy example in the paper, they say, imagine we have some training data that is coming from this expression. So we have some two input, one is x and y, and then we have the corresponding output according to this function here. If you want to learn this um, train this network, you don't know beforehand how many uh, nodes you need or how many uh, layers you need or how many uh, learnable functions you need. So what we do usually when we want to um, train a network like this, we create a slightly bigger network than we think we need and then we sparsify it to reduce it to its bare minimum. And this sparsification is done with regularization. When we work with the multilayer perceptron, when we want to sparsify our network, we have a loss function, right? Because we want our uh, output of our network map with the match with the training data. So, for example, we use the mean squared error, and let's call this one the prediction loss. Then we add another term that is multiplied by some coefficient called the lambda that we can choose. That is um, that multiplies it with this is the L1 uh, L1 regulariz regularizer, uh, which is the uh, absolute value of the weights of this network. And this is in the case of the multilayer perceptron, because if we use this loss here, this uh, combined loss. Uh, what will happen is that the network will make to have a compromise between reducing the prediction loss and also reducing the weights of the network. So it will force the network to sparsify it. It means that not all neurons will be activated. It will also make it such that more, a lot of weights will be zero, completely zero. They do a similar procedure in this case for the kolmogorov arnold networks in which they cannot use the L1 regularizer because we do not have learnable weights but we have learnable functions. So they find a way to uh, create a regularizer using the activation of this function. So they use as regularizer what is the magnitude of the activations of each of these functions so that our network uh, so they create a loss like this, like the L1, L, um, the prediction loss plus the regularizer. So tell me the little, let's say lambda regularizer. So the network will have to make a compromise between uh, activating too many functions and uh, and reducing the loss. So it will be forced to reduce the loss and to reduce the number of activations that it uh, of these functions that are activated. Uh, so minimizing the uh, active the, um, the magnitude of these activations so once they train the network with this loss uh, they see that a lot of functions are actually have a very little magnitude of activation mean it means that they they contribute very little to the output so for example uh, to this output they see that or uh, let's say this output or this output or the final output they see that uh, this one contributes less than one percent for example so they can just delete it this is called the pruning that you delete the the parts of the network that contribute very little to the final prediction once they prune it, they realize that the network learned functions that are actually the same as the initial expression from which they derived the training data. So the network actually learned the structure of the expression from which it received the tra training data. So as you can see, we have an input x, we have an input y. The input x is run through a function that is very similar to a sign. It's not exactly a sign, but it's, it's very similar to a sign. Um, this is a, a parabola, so it's a quadratic function. So the y is run to a function that is very similar to a, a quadratic function. And then they are summed up because we saw before that at nodes here, we sum up the output of these two functions and then run to another function that is uh, very similar to an exponential, as you can see, to create the final output. Um, so as you can see, the network, uh, in order to learn a mapping between data that has this 
expression actually recreates the same structure of this expression inside each of these learnable functions given that they, you give it enough uh, expressive power so you give enough control points to these learned functions to actually be able to approximate these functions correctly so you you need to give at least five or six points in this uh, function here to make it look like a sign um, of course, this function is not really a, a sign. It could be a sign translated somehow or scaled somehow. So they do another uh, procedure to learn the scaling factor of the sign and the translation factor. Uh, because it's not really a sign of x. It is probably uh, uh, a sign of uh, b x plus c plus d so they, they they do another procedure to learn this scaling factor this translation factor and this translation factor and this scaling factor but anyway the point is the network was able to learn exactly the mapping of the training data using the same functions and this is very important for interpretability because imagine in some uh, industries is actually uh, kind of mandatory because imagine you are working in the healthcare sector and you're creating a model that uh, tells you how much dose of a certain medicine you need to give to the patient things go wrong and uh, you cannot tell to the judge that uh, you gave this dose because the model told you so you need to give some kind of uh, verifiability some kind of uh, interpretability of why you made that decision or why the model is making that decision and this is uh, um, this can happen with uh, Kolmogorov networks and it's something that was very difficult if not impossible to do with uh, multilayer perception it's very difficult to do with multilayer perceptions Another very interesting fact is this continual learning and the, um, and that the fact that we can avoid catastrophic forgetting. So let's take a step back. When we train a neural network, suppose a multilayer perceptron, mm -hmm. it happens a lot of time that you train the... Uh, suppose let's talk about the language models. So imagine you train a language model on Japanese data and then you want to train the language model also to uh, learn a little bit of, let's say, uh, English. So you train it a little more on English data. What will happen is that the language model will improve on the English language tasks, but will probably forget the Japanese language. Uh, this is called, uh, this is a problem with multilayer perceptrons and they, they made a toy example here to show uh, that uh, the Kolmogorov Arnold networks react better to this problem. So what they did, they created some training data that is here. So it's a list of peaks of Gaussians, so like this. So this is all the training data, but they don't give all the training data at the same moment to the networks. So first they only give the first part of the training data, so only these points to the network, so to the CAN and to the multilayer perceptron. And then they evaluate the network on the training data and also outside of the training data. So they, train, they, they run the evaluation on this part of the um, training data and they see that both perform quite well. Then they run the evaluation also on this part and then they see that of course the both networks produce uh, results that are not good because they didn't learn the rest of the data yet. Then they feed the next part, so they, they take this network that has already been trained on the phase one and train it on the next part of the input, which is this part here. And then they evaluate it again on all the range of the input, of the input data, of the training data, not only on the part that it has been trained upon, but on all of it. And they see that the multilayer perceptron do not behave very well on the data they have seen in the previous phase because they have already forgotten it, while the CAN still remembers it, so still performs well on the part that was in the previous training phase. And they do it for the third phase and see that the CAN actually learn also the third phase, but without forgetting the previous two, while the multilayer perceptron is only performing well on the third phase, while it has already forgotten how to perform well on the first two. And they do it for all the phases of this training data. And this is amazing, actually. And actually, we also know kind of why it happens. And it's related to, to the local control property that we saw of the B-splines before. So let me open the example again. Uh, as we saw before, if we move a point on a B spline, it will affect only the local um, the local area of the curve, not the entire curve. So what is happening here when we train the suppose initially all the control points are here, 
so the network, uh, because I, if I remember correctly, in the paper they say that they initialize the function so that they always predict zero for the input. So suppose that the uh, network is predicting always zero like this. When they feed the first part of the training data, the network learns this mapping. Then they feed the second part of the training data, then the network learns this mapping here. So, as you can see, the network learns to move only some control points without affecting the other control points, so it retains the information it has learned in the past. And this is thanks to the local control point of the B splines. Thank you guys for watching my video. I, I hope that uh, you learned a lot also today. I, um, it was quite a demanding video, I have to say. I didn't have much time to prepare it also, uh, especially because the, 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 the paper came out like 10 days ago and uh, I had to kind of, um, you know, review a lot of topics that I had forgotten. And uh, plus I'm working full time, so it's, it always takes a lot of effort to make this kind of content. But I still I believe that um, uh, I hope that you that you learned uh, that you got a lot of knowledge from this video. At least you know how to make uh, Bezier curves now. And uh, if you like this content, please share it with your friends. Please share it on social media. This is the best way to help me and to motivate me to make a more quality content like this one. If there are some inaccuracies, please forgive me. I I try to make it as precise as possible, but I also try to simplify concepts. So sometimes I have to use inaccurate wording or inaccurate phrases. Um, I hope to make uh, more videos like this in the future. So please uh, follow my channel, subscribe and like the video if you like it. And uh, thank you for being in the audience.